can you summarize where we started and where from your perspective you think we are heading yeah yeah so um so I, I recently thought about this because I I put together a, a book which hopefully should come out this this fall uh, about more or less arguing why people should engage more with computers at the level of kind of programming them telling telling computers what to do and I uh, some of the first examples that I can find in human history of telling machines what to do are things like uh, in ancient Egypt there were door locks that are actually pretty similar to the to modern door locks in, in the sense that they have different pins and the key kind of pushes up the pins in the right pattern. And, and that way you have to have the right key to unlock the lock. The, the sense in which that's kind of like a computer is that it's just sitting there doing what you want, which is to say not opening the door until a person comes along with the right instructions and then it, then it releases. And so you, as the person with the, the door that's being locked, you can put your sense of what you want to accomplish into the machine, and then the machine accomplishes it without your conscious attention, right? This is different than tools like shovels and, and picks uh, that people have been using for many, 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 many years uh, that do require your constant personal attention to, to make them work. A thing like a door lock is nice because you can just set it and forget it, put it out there, and it does its job even when you're not paying attention. Now, there's nothing particularly programmable about a, a door lock. You have to build it a certain way, and if you want to change its behavior, you have to build it a different way. But um, by the time of the ancient Greeks, it was not uncommon to create a kind of programmable robot. And these robots uh, were really just carts, like wheeled carts that could roll around on the floor, but their wheels were controlled by ropes that were wound up in different patterns. And the patterns controlled the way that it would actually move when it was when it was out in the world. And so this was used, we think they were probably used uh, in, in theater performances. So you put this kind of magical cart on the ground and it, and it does this little dance. But the, the notion that you can wind the rope a particular way, now we're starting to get into programmable machines. Now, of course, it wasn't until so much, much later, uh, the 1800s or so, when people started to try to build programmable machines that were much more general, more, more uh, covered, covered a, a greater range of, of behaviors than just moving. Uh, you know, Charles Babbage looked at ways of encoding different possible programs as positions of dials and, and on a purely mechanical device. And then later, people like Alan Turing uh, thought long and hard about how we could program electronic computers. And that's kind of the beginnings of, of the machines that we have today. Uh, a lot of them were created in, in, uh, in wartime to try to figure out how to compute trajectories of ballistics like, like missiles and, and, and so forth. Uh, but to do that, you want a machine that can actually carry out a wide range of possible different instructions. And people worked out ways of telling machines what to do that kind of have now evolved into the machines that we have all around us today including uh, the laptop that I'm speaking to you on. And, you know, the things in our pockets, like telephones are now just fully, power, very, very powerful computers on order of the, the the power of what used to be supercomputers when I first started out in the field. We now just all have it. We just, you know, I'm going to use mine to play games and I can use it as a coaster and just put my drinks on it. Like it just, it's just remarkable how far things have come in uh, in just a few short decades, really. And from the the point where Microsoft and similar companies uh, took off with taking things a little bit from the technical side of it and getting like more in the personal uh, sphere, can you comment on that a bit? Yeah, it's really interesting because in the very early days of computers, uh, they were being manufactured by big companies and they were extremely expensive and huge. And so it didn't really make sense for a person to have a computer. An organization would have a computer and it would run jobs for everyone in that organization. But it wasn't too long after they started to get out there, especially into universities, that people began to say, well, I want it to do what I want it to do. I don't I don't care what the company's doing. Like, I would like to just play around with it. And so uh, the notion of time sharing came about. And the idea of time sharing was one computer, like literally one physical computer, but lots of different people connected to it. And it would take turns doing a little bit for the first person, a little bit for the second person, a little bit for the third person. And they were fast enough that it felt like everybody had their own piece of it, right? They weren't spending a lot of time waiting. They were they were actually interacting with it in real time. And so that's, now we're talking about the, the 1960s, the 1970s, 
Um, that's kind of the 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 birth of the idea of wait, I want a computer that's my computer. And when companies began to manufacture actual computers that were freestanding and they were inexpensive enough that you could take them home, um, that 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 changed the game a lot, and it became something that individuals could own and and purpose for for their own interests. His, history doesn't repeat itself, but it kind of rhymes. And I would like to hear your thoughts at what stage are we in regards to having a tool like ChatGPT and similar to help solve complicated mathematical problems like your like your friend, let's say. So would, you would ask something like, okay, let's try this. Okay, it doesn't work. Do your computations. Okay, let's try this then. Kind of a personal assistant. Yeah, that's a really interesting vision about where things could be going. I personally, like I started off... Uh, I had a computer when I was a teenager. Uh, so this is like 1979. So this is this is now quite a while ago. Um, and it didn't have any software on it, right? So anything that I wanted the computer to do, I had to express in a programming language and, and make happen. And so to me, the relationship that I'm comfortable with with computers is the computer is a thing that I can tell what to do. Now, as computers, to make computers become widespread, it seemed important to make them a little bit you know, easier to use. And the easier to use they were, the more that uh, the more people could engage in computing. So that's a good thing. But also the more of the power of computer that was being hidden from everyone. And that's a bad thing because once that power is hidden and what's in between the power of the computer and the individual who has the computer is some software company, it gives that software company a tremendous amount of incentive to use its power for its own purposes. And so in the early days, the computer did what I want. Now my own computer, I very often don't know why it's doing what it's doing. And sometimes it's because some company wanted it to do that. That is not, not in my personal interests. And so um, I've been kind of unhappy with how our relationship with computers has been for the last, boy, it's you know probably coming on 20 years now when lots and lots of us have access to tremendous power, but it's all mediated by, by companies who have an incentive to modify that power for their own purposes. To me, it's always been about my wishes being implemented in the computer. And so I always gravitate towards like friendly computer languages, like Scratch, for example, is, is super fun. It's a way of, of uh, just very easily expressing to the computer what you want it to do that's accessible to lots and lots of people. But I've always thought that we could go further. We could actually use the power that is being developed in the artificial intelligence community to just make it easier for us to partner with machines, to, to ask the computer to do the things that I want it to do. And, and as you pointed out in the last month or so, uh, many, many people have now access to a program called ChatGPT, which is pretty remarkable because you can communicate with it in natural language. You can just type English or I don't even know what other languages it understands, but it, it knows a lot more. One of the things that's remarkable about it is, is it knows more than the designers of the program even knew that it knew. And so you're, we're always finding new little corners of it. You can ask it to translate between languages. You can ask it to write code on your behalf because it was trained on the internet, like the stuff that you can find on the internet of which there's many, many, many things that are explained fairly well, well enough that a, that a system can actually work out what's going on with it. So so the idea of us starting to use ChatGPT as that kind of a, a, a delegation partner, like I'm, tr I'm working on a problem, could you help me with this piece of it, is really very natural. Now, one of the problems is that ChatGPT itself is, it's really trained as a, as a hyperactive autocomplete, right? It only is trying to guess what a person would say next. And often what a person would say next is the answer to your question. If you ask a question, the thing that follows it is often the answer to that question. But it's not, it's not really a full-fledged partner in the sense that it can't work out new things on its own. It can't, you can't delegate processes to it. You can just ask it to fill in the blanks about what might come next. You can kind of have a conversation with a thing like that, but you can also have a broken conversation. It'll do kind of, it'll go along with you wherever you want to go. And sometimes it's, that's not a good place to go. And so we don't yet have programs that have that conversational power of chat GPT with the, I don't know, the, the actual programmability of something that can follow detailed instructions to the letter, right? 
So I don't know if that quite answers your question, but that was what it made me think about. From your assessment, do you think there's still a large leap until we get there? Because it seems kind of natural to get there. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very interesting. I spend a lot of time thinking about that that particular question because the chat GPT that we have today is very, very powerful, but also extremely unpredictable. And it makes bizarre mistakes, right? Mistakes that that you really wouldn't, that normally we would consider to be a bug, like, oh, there's an error in the program. But it's not, it's not a bug. It's it's just, it's just riffing. It's just kind of like a jazz improvisational artist, just kind of going with the text the way it is. And it's not, it's not intended to be so controlled, right? The way that we normally think about a a, a delegation partner being trustworthy and uh, and careful. And so there's the fun it's fundamental in the way these things are created that they are improvisational artists and so making them much more reliable consistent partners may require a rethinking of the way that these systems are built uh it's hard to tell it may be oh wait there's a small tweak if we just change it this way but it's also quite possible that it's just inherent in the way these systems are are built that they they're always going to be too loose too associative to really be useful as somebody you can depend on. A variation of the same question, but uh, in specific to coding. I've seen some examples with ChatGPT, but th there's still a large gap until you actually tell it or a tool similar to that, like do this fully fledged app and maintain it. Where are we right now in this universe specific to coding? Yeah, I think I think we're not that close. Um, I think the code, it's, it is, stunning that these language models can actually produce code. And people have done, in the, just in the last few years, have done a lot to make that code a little bit more dependable, a little bit more meaningful, so that the code is not just, you know, like so it's syntactically correct, so that it actually could run on a computer. But the notion that that the system could actually like have a specification, have an understanding of what is actually trying to be accomplished, and check that against what the computer is actually doing, or the computer is playing two roles here, to check the computer that is the programmer can check against the computer that is running that program uh, to make sure that it actually is valid. It's funny because we think of when we ask people to do that, we think of making them, we're, we're treating them like computers, right? We're saying, okay, we need you to just be really precise, really careful, just like computers tend to be. But the fact of the matter is it's hard for chat GPT to pretend to be that kind of computer just the way that it's hard for people to pretend to be that kind of computer. Like we're just too, we're loose. We can learn to be more precise. We can learn to use mathematics and, and logic and rules. And ChatGPT is similar. It doesn't naturally want to do that. Um, we can teach it that, but it's still, it still doesn't seem to, to hold itself to any kind of formal standard. And again, that may require, it may require a different kind of structure of a of program. Entering the, the same token on the development of personal computers, the same thing for artificial intelligence and machine learning. Can you share your thoughts a bit on what's reinforcement learning and key concepts for people to learn more about? Sure. So reinforcement learning is the part of AI that's my field of interest that I've been working on for 30 years, um, which has to do with basically computers making decisions and looking at the outcomes of their decisions. You, If you think about... Um, modern machine learning the way that it's pr the way that it's constructed the way that it's built is you give lots and lots and lots of examples and it learns to mimic those examples so we're kind of tr programming it by example like i want a program that produces this kind of output here's lots of examples of it now the 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 machine learning algorithm then produces a program that actually can do that that's very um copy based right that, that it's it's about taking those inputs and producing the same kind of outputs as I do but it's not doesn't have a lot of freedom what reinforcement learning is about is trying to program computers by giving them information about the outcome that they should achieve you know it's like it's good to save energy right it would be nice if this picture were lovely right like without real details of saying no do this like mimic it put it together in this way, we're saying, well, here's a way to judge your output. You know, if it costs a lot of money, that's not great. If it hurts people, that's not great. Now figure out a way to accomplish that task. 
the most natural example of, of a reinforcement learning program doing its job is in the context of games. So when you play a game, you're told, okay, here are the rules of the game. You have to stay within those rules, but I'm not gonna tell you what moves to take. That's up to you to figure out, but I will tell you the objective, the end goal. And if you manage to make that happen, you win the game. If you can't make that happen, then I don't know, you should try again. Uh, reinforcement learning is about solving those kinds of problems where we have a way of measuring success at the end, but we don't necessarily know the path to get there. And a lot of problems in, in the real world have a similar kind of form. Like we, we don't know how to solve global warming, but we know what the bad things are. We know if the temperature keeps rising, that's not good. We know that if people starve to death, that's not good. And so human beings are trying to solve this problem without any, without any example to copy. Right. All we have is a notion of what would be a good answer or a bad answer, but not a specific thing to mimic. And so reinforcement learning is about the same idea, but for computers. Do we provide positive output to say you can do that again or on the same token, negative uh, input saying this is a bad idea to do? Yeah. So one way to train a reinforcement learning agent is to actually have a human being monitoring them and saying, you know, that thing you just did, the uh, and in fact, you, we mentioned ChatGPT before. One of the ways that ChatGPT has become a little bit more predictable is through uh, a, a round of reinforcement learning that happens in the design of the system. So most of what it knows about language, it knows because it was just fed lots and lots of examples of web pages. And so that's trained essentially using a supervised learning or, or a, a standard machine learning kind of technique. But then people have said, well, I don't, sometimes I don't like what it puts out. I don't know what to tell it to do instead, but I know that I don't like this and I do like this. And so the, for example, OpenAI that, uh, that, that created ChatGPT, they collected many, 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 many examples of here's a query that someone typed. Here's different things that you could output. I hate that. I hate that. That's not so bad. That's great. And they retrain or they tune, they kind of uh, modify the way that ChatGPT behaves automatically to be more consistent with those examples. And so it is very much doing what you're saying is people said, I like this, I don't like this. And that gets translated into new behavior uh, in the, in, by the computer. Challenges and limitations of reinforcement learning. How is it your work is addressing these? Yeah. So one of the challenges is it's just a really hard problem. Like you could argue that it is equivalent to the problem of being an intelligent agent, right? Like it is the AI problem. Um, more so than say language models or chat GPT is, it really is about how do I get by in the world? How do I act to, to make something happen? So that's hard. So everybody's trying to work on better algorithms for solving these problems. But there's other issues that people have come to realize that are very challenging, which is well, if we're telling these machines what to do by setting a goal for it, and we don't give it a lot of constraint about how to solve that goal, maybe it'll solve the goal in a way that we actually didn't want. Like we just left out constraints that we thought were important. And so an example that I like to use from, from human history is there was a, apparently there was a cobra problem in India uh, many, many decades ago. And the, the British folks who had uh, colonized India didn't like that. And they're like, well, we need to get rid of the Cobra. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to offer $10 for dead Cobras. So people can kill, will kill the Cobras, bring us the dead Cobras. We'll give them money and the, pro the Cobra problem will get wiped out. But here's the problem. The incentive that they gave was bring me a Cobra, bring me a dead Cobra. So people were like, I, I like money. That's a good thing that helps me, you know, live my life, support my family. I'm going to raise Cobras and then kill them. I'm going to make more Cobras so that I have something to bring to them to get money. And so the result of this policy, instead of wiping out the Cobra population, it exploded the Cobra cop population. Now there were people farming Cobras uh, and there were Cobras everywhere. So uh, this is the sort of thing that can sometimes go wrong in the reinforcement learning setting where you set what seems on the surface to be a very reasonable set of incentives, but there's a way to satisfy those incentives that is a counter to what the person who created the incentives actually wanted. And so that's a, that's a huge issue in in reinforcement learning that we're we really don't that we're just we're, we're trying to grapple with we're trying to find ways of extracting from someone what the actual goal is so that the machine doesn't accidentally satisfy something else. And what about multi-agent reinforcements, like multiple agents in a way they can co uh, coordinate their actions in a shared environment, similar like to game theory, for instance. 
Yeah, no, that's a really great question. The, the, it's very natural for if an agent is kind of acting intelligent and it's in the world, it's going to be surrounded by other intelligent agents, us for one thing, but also potentially other programs that are also that are that are solving similar or related tasks. And uh, there's a there's a large community in the artificial intelligence world that is look, looking at questions of well, how do you set up incentives so that if all the individual components of a system are all just trying to satisfy their own incentives, that the larger system is accomplishing some some grander goal. So, for example, if you have a reinforcement learning agent in every traffic light in a city. Uh, it has its own goals. It's trying to not have people wait too long and let people through and not have accidents. So it has its own little problem to solve, but it's actually part of this much larger system. And if you want the traffic to flow smoothly throughout the city, you want those, those individual learning agents to be coordinated in some way. And as you point out, the field that has uh, kind of formalized that question and has a number of tools for addressing it is known as game theory. It sort of comes out of economics, but in fact, it touches... Uh, many, many feel like biologists think about game theory, computer scientists think about game theory, anybody who's who's interested in, in problems where there's independent decision makers that form a larger system, uh, questions about how to how to think about their individual incentives and their interactions are game theory questions. And how do you see a reinforcement learning evolving in the com upcoming years, like new breakthroughs, things that are very well needed at this point in time? Yeah, yeah. My, my own personal interest. I mean, there's a, there's tons of people now who are working on better algorithms. Like, given given the objective and given the environment, how do you make a system that learns better in that environment? Which is a very reasonable thing to want to do. But what I've gotten very interested in is the question of 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 the incentives. How do we specify tasks to a reinforcement learner? If the people who are developing algorithms are successful, and we get these algorithms that are really good at whatever goal you tell them to do, we the people need to figure out how to express our, our interests in reward functions so that these algorithms can do what they have to do. And that turns out to be a much harder problem than I think people appreciated. The field, in some ways, the field grows out of biology or, or psych, uh, biological psychology where, where people were thinking, well, I don't know. I mean, animals seem to behave this way. People seem to behave this way. You give them incentives, they change their behavior so they can get more good things and avoid more bad things. So trying to understand those algorithms maybe helps us understand people better, maybe helps us understand animals better. But at the same time, if you think of it as an engineering tool, like this is something that we're using to create systems that are going to be in the world, it's our responsibility to figure out what these systems should should want or and what these systems should dislike so that they actually behave in a way that makes us happy. And so I think that's a that's kind of a big open problem. And I, the more progress we make on it, the more I think we move to a world where we can say to the computer, okay, this is what I want. The computer can learn to actually carry it out effectively. What about possible problems when decisions are made based on real-time data from sensors, drones, and other sources? Because it presents mm -hmm. a problem because, the, the, like, say, the sources, like uh, sensors and all that, they could be like malfunctioning, so they introduce additional errors. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of the algorithms in reinforcement learning are predicated on the idea that the that the learner has a complete and accurate picture of the current state of the world. And as you point out, I mean, that's not the world we live in. We're always like, what's behind? It? You know, we're we're always wondering. There's always information that's missing, and we have to we as as agents in the world have to make our decisions in spite of the fact that we don't know. Sometimes we have to explicitly like, you know, what's in that bag. I'll look in the bag. Like you take actions that that are specifically are trying to help you decide how to re reveal the information that you need to solve problems. We're not great at creating algorithms that can do that today. And so there's a lot of folks who that's that's what they're focusing on. We don't really know how people do it. A lot of it comes down to you have a sufficiently detailed model of the things around you that's good enough that you can pretend that you can see things that you can't see. But sometimes it matters. Sometimes you actually have to pay attention to, I don't know what's around that corner. You know, I'm, I'm uh, riding my bike or whatever, and I'm about to turn a corner. I know it's a blind corner. There could be a car coming. There could be a someone with a gun there. Like, I don't know what's there. I should slow down. I should change my behavior to reflect the fact that my that I'm acting under uncertainty. And um, that is that's that's a tough problem. We don't have a lot of programs that can do that yet.
Because with the amount of capital and, and the obviously intelligent people dedicated to solving the self, uh, self-driving cars, there's still a lot of uh, things that kind of unsolved, especially how humans operate. Because for some reason, we can make decisions that kind of it's kind of hard for a computer to to make. Yeah, so there's a lot of challenge in in the self-driving car space. One of the ones that I think you're pointing out is that self-driving cars have to have their own sense of psychology of other people. They have to know, okay, there's another car out there. They're heading this way. Are they going to swerve? Are they going to stop? Are they going to continue through the intersection? You can't just assume that they're always going to do the worst possible thing because cars that do that, you can program a car to do that. But what it will do is it'll go to the side of the road and it will stop and it will hide because something bad is going to happen. Something bad is going to happen. When we are out in the world, especially when we're driving, if you've ever taught a kid to drive or a teenager to drive, it is, it is harrowing because there's so much that you know as a driver that you realize, oh my gosh, they don't know that. They don't know that, for example, if, if you're putting yourself into the intersection, all the other cars around you are watching you and you're sent, you're you're sending a message with the position of your car and the speed that you're coming into the intersection, they are interpreting that message and they're changing their behavior based on that. If you don't speak that language as, as, a, as a beginning driver doesn't know to do, you can get into an accident, accident very easily because people think you're going to do one thing and you do something else. So that notion of 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 making predictions of of being aware of the psychology of the other drivers is um yeah is we don't we don't know how to build programs like that we we don't have the chat gpt doesn't really have a great mental model of the the people that it's conversing with and the cars don't have a great mental model of how all the other drivers are acting so people generally make up stuff they're like well the people writing the program will say well if you're if another car is partway through the intersection it's probably going to continue going through the yeah. intersection but what we as people are doing is we're actually like in their heads of the, of the other drivers thinking they didn't see the pedestrian but they're going to see that pedestrian in a, in 4 seconds and when they do that they're going to slam on the brakes i am not going into that intersection i'm going to back off and wait to see how this plays out right we can we can sort of see the future and in the way that we're predicting the future, we're also factoring in the mental state of all the decision makers that are around us. Now, we don't do it perfectly and we don't do it on huge scale, but we do it so fast and we do it seemingly effortlessly. And uh, and again, this is this is something that as soon as you try to instill that into a into a computer, it looks like the most impossible, intractable problem ever. And there's just no way we could ever do it and nothing will ever drive again. So, so finding that line where we can say, well, it's taking some of this into consideration, but it doesn't require 18 supercomputers to make every decision. Uh, that's tough. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're not seeing a lot of self-driving cars. Not, not more than five years ago, people were like, oh, this is going to be a solved problem any day now. And it's not because there's a lot going on that people didn't realize. Can you uh, sh- share uh, your thoughts on exploration and exploitation? Yeah. So, so for those who haven't thought about it, this is a this is a key issue, especially in reinforcement learning. Agents that have to learn about the world by interacting with that world need to sometimes put themselves out there, try something that they don't know what's going to happen because that's going to give them the new information, new data uh, to to better understand what's happening. And so there's a tension uh, between exploiting, that is to say, take what you know and using it to solve the problem versus exploring, doing something new, doing something uh, sort of unpredictable to gain new information so that you can become better informed about the world. The early uh, recommendation systems had to contend with this. I think it's still an issue in in recommendation systems. So programs that are showing you news stories that they think you're going to like, they don't know what you like in the beginning and they don't know what news stories are going to be popular because they don't really understand. So they have to do some amount of, hey, let's show this to some people and see what they think. And then they can use that to factor in uh, better decision-making later. That's a a really um, commonplace and maybe relatable example of where the systems have to do some exploitation, like giving people articles that the the programs think people are really going to like while at the same time doing some amount of exploration to say, well, this could be, you know, a movie recommendation system, like this could be a huge hit, but nobody knows about it. Let's see what people see, how people react to it. And that like, let's see, let's try that's exploration. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of work in trying to instill those kinds of ideas into computer programs so that they can learn more about the world while they're interacting with the world. 
For people entering the field, especially students, what would some of your recommendation be like for areas of interest that are very well needed at this point? Yeah, I mean, boy, I mean, the stuff that I can think of is stuff that if you try to train yourself to do it, it's probably going to be too late. Like the field will have moved on. And knowing what the next thing is, is really hard because, you know, the future is difficult to predict. So, so what would I say? I mean, I think there's increasing interest in trying to understand what happens when these programs are put into the world, right? And so there's there's folks that really need to study what's sometimes called the socio-technical boundary, the, 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 the edge between the impact on people and the actual technology that's 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 acting in the world. There's just, I think that's that problem is gonna keep us busy for a really long time because people keep changing, technology keeps changing, the problems that we wanna solve keep changing. So there's always gonna be something to think about at that boundary. In terms of, um, you know, sort of more discrete technical questions, I I personally think, again, getting computers to understand our intentions better so that we can task them with things and, and be assured that they will carry out what we want. That's That to me is a really great and important question. I'd love to see more people thinking about that. Um, and you know, these questions about how to take something like ChatGPT and make it a more reliable partner as opposed to just an unpredictable crazy person um, who's often right, but then often wrong and doesn't seem to know the difference between those two cases. That's um, that's a really you know medium term pressing question that could turn into a much more interesting long term question. Thank <laughs> you.